a very distinguished guest today. If you don't know already, uh, Greg Wolk uh, is a retired civil trial lawyer and a 1975 graduate of the New York University School of Law. Uh, he is the author of Friend of Foe Alike, and you'll see it right out there on the table there if you'd like to take a look at that. It's very, very good. Um, a tour guide to Missouri's Civil War, uh, which he knows a lot about. He's a lifetime resident of St. Louis, and his interest in Missouri's Civil War dates to the 1970s, and he's going to tell you more about his connection to the Civil War, a very personal connection as well. Um, uh, he's had uh, a number of things going on through the years. Um, in uh, 1999 to 2000, um, he served on a, a committee formed by the Missouri Humanities Commission that was, um, um, I can't read my writing, <laughs> that was tasked with uh, making recommendations for Missouri's uh, commemoration of, of the Civil War's uh, 19, uh, 150th anniversary. So from that um, enterprise that he got involved with. Uh, he's done all kinds of things and this was uh, the result of one of those things. So um, his presentation entitled uh, Forged in Missouri, Ulysses S. Grant and the Show Me State, uh, I present to you Mr. Greg Wolk. Thank, thank you very much and first of all my respects to the Riney family and particularly to the memory of Carpool Riney and I'm very pleased to be here today for that event. Um, you're all trying to guess why my name is Wolk, and the reason is, is Bob's great-great-grandfather, great, great one great, and my great-great-grandfather were brothers, and both of them served in the Civil War uh, with the 78th uh, Missouri EMM. Uh, and then I have another great-great-grandfather on my mother's side, uh, who was actually a private in Ulysses Grant's regiment, the 21st Illinois, when Ulysses Grant was uh, marching through Missouri. So that's a special thing for me. <laughs> also special for me is the fact that in my retirement, I get to be employed by the Missouri Humanities Council part-time. That's the, the best key to it, to happiness, uh, as a um, heritage uh, uh, programs coordinator. <clears throat> In that regard, uh, I want to explain to you what uh, this organization has done because as of a few weeks ago, we are commemorating the 200th birthday of Ulysses Grant. It's going to last through the year. And so if all this works, I want to explain, first of all, a couple of the <coughs> programs that we're going to be doing at, at, with the humanities. Uh, First of all, the Missouri Humanities Council is a uh, not-for-profit that is formed, uh, was formed by the state of Missouri as part of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And it has been around for just 50 years, uh, but it, with funds that are supplied by the uh, uh, Missouri government and by the National Endowment for the Humanities, it promotes a public understanding of, well, our humanities, and that's literature and in history, in archaeology, among other things. Uh, we are putting together, we have put together a touring exhibit of Grant's time in Missouri <coughs> um, that uh, is now at the Ulysses S. Grant National Historic Site in St. Louis. And come June 1, it will be at the State Archives. And from there, there's many places you'll be able to see it over the next uh, 12 months. Cape Girardeau will have it in September, so I urge you to go visit Cape Girardeau when that time comes. <coughs> oh, I have to face that one. <laughs> well, come on. There we go. Uh, the other main event that will now be the ninth time that this is presented is called the U.S. Grant Symposium. Uh, as part of the bicentennial celebration, uh, we are dedicating this particular event uh, to uh, the, the bicentennial. Um, it is held at the Soldiers Memorial Museum in St. Louis. If you aren't able to get there on July 23rd, uh, 2022, it will be available online. Actually, uh, when you leave, there's a, a clipboard there if you're interested in getting more information about these events, including where the exhibit's going to be when, just write down your name and your, uh, your uh, 
email address, and we'll get that information as it developed. I did it again. <laughs> Do it that way, advance, and this way, the point. Anyways. You can't talk about uh, Missouri's, or I'm sorry, Grant's time in Missouri without talking about his hard scrabble years. Now, I borrowed that from the name of this cabin that many of you may have seen in St. Louis at Grant's farm, which is the reconstructed cabin that used to be about a mile away from there. Uh, it has an interesting history of its own since it was at the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis. It was somewhere else for a while, and then uh, Dolphus Bush, out of regard to the general, bought it and reassembled it, not where it used to be. But in any case, uh, very briefly, his background in these six years uh, that uh, I call the hard, hard scrabble uh, years is, first of all, the most important connection he had to Missouri, and it was a strong one, is that he got assigned to Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis right out of West Point. Uh, he, like many, many of his fellows, met a St. Louis girl, and uh, in this case, uh, he had to wait a few years while he went to the Mexican War and whatnot before they married, but they married in 1854, I'm sorry, 1848 in St. Louis, and then he went off for the next six years while she uh, gave birth to children. <laughs> He visited occasionally, and um, he, he was out on the west, west coast for most of that time. So he uh, resigned his commission, probably under a cloud. There are people debate about that, uh, and came back to St. Louis at the time. Um, down on the farm means, uh, for that period of time, uh, first of all, he lived uh, essentially on a slave plantation, even though... Um, he was conflicted because his parents happened to be a, um, uh, well, anti-slavery, some say abolitionist, and uh, he's married into a family uh, that owns about 30 slaves. And one thing you would find about Grant when you study him is <coughs> this was sort of typical, okay, certainly at this age. He he, he just went with the flow most of the time. He didn't express opinions. Uh, he, he, now, his parents didn't even come to the wedding because he, of who he was marrying, but he didn't make any trouble with anybody about it. But as you'll see, uh, he paid pretty dearly for that association. <laughs> um, breakout is what I'm calling when he finally... Uh, well, the circumstances were not the best, but he finally broke loose and got his own life uh, about 1850, uh, uh, let's see, 58, uh, because uh, basically there had been a global panic in the, while he had been farming for five years, uh, the cr crop prices went to all hell, and so he had to leave. And in order to leave, he got a job as a real estate agent, in essence, with a cousin of his wife, Julia. And again, consistent with his history, he was always looking for help from somebody until actually he was about 39 years old, um, in which when he joined, rejoined the Army, and two years later he ran the United States Army. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go through his <laughs> somewhat uh, dire uh, situation. Um, so he moves uh, to become part of this real estate agency into the unheated back room of his cousin, or his wife's cousin, Henry Boggs. And they start this business. And they, uh, uh, he moves there in January, uh, lives in that back room by himself, and he walks home about 10 miles each way every weekend to see his wife and kids. <coughs> but um, that... I did it again. <laughs> he uh, that business went under, you might, as you might imagine. One reason was Ulysses wasn't really able to go collect rent from people because, again, he's somewhat uh, uh, a, a modest man. 
Um, so he, there was a couple other job opportunities. One, he got a job with the uh, collector of, um, of uh, well, it was a collector of revenue, essentially, and then the guy died. And then he uh, tried to become the county engineer for St. Louis County. <laughs> and um, there were uh, five commissioned commissioners who were going to decide who to offer this job to. Um, three of them were what we call uh, free salt soilers, which was an early name for people who were against the expansion of slavery. The other two were Democrats, okay? Things, roles were reversed that way back then. Well, since he lived on the plantation of his father-in-law, everybody, he never talked about politics, but everybody just assumed that he must be a Democrat, so the three uh, uh, free soilers voted for some other guy. And very soon after that, Grant kind of tailed between his legs, uh, headed off where he got a job in Galena, Illinois. Uh, in his father's leather store. Incidentally, this is uh, a 1938 picture of the house that Julie and he owned in South St. Louis. By legend, I guess I would say, um, that house is now surrounded by another house, and it is still there, although no one I know has ever seen the inside of it, and it has not, probably in my lifetime, gone up for sale, but it is still there. Do you know what street? Uh, it is a, a Barton Street, B-A-R-T-O-N. And the zip code? Uh, zip code. The neighborhood? Uh, it's Soulard. Soulard. I probably don't know about Yeah. So on to the next subject. I look like I probably already... This doesn't work behind the back. There we go. Okay. The grants in Galena. So he goes to uh, Galena, Illinois, which is way up north uh, of Illinois. Uh, he, he's there about a year working for his father. It's, he's a clerk in a basically a harness shop because his father was well off and had basically branched out from his home base in Ohio. And Ulysses was doing some traveling sales and whatnot. And they rented a house. They had four kids by this time. And then all of a sudden, the Civil War comes in. And that's April of uh, two, uh, 1861, of course. Um, he's got this experience. He was a captain in the regular army. And so uh, he basically volunteered to help drill the first uh, company to come out of Galena. Uh, they, the city fathers offered him to take command of that uh, unit. Now, a company is technically about 100 men, and it is run by a captain. Well, Grant said he was a proud man, even though he had just gone through all these years of, of pain. Um, no, he wasn't going to take that rank because he, he deserved more. He was a captain in the regular army. So uh, he waits then, and it sort of looks like it had been looking for the last several years for him. Nobody wants to, to hire him except when that... Uh, <laughs> company was trained, he took them to Springfield. And now as Grant reported in his um, Springfield, Illinois, that is, as Grant reported in his memoirs, um, he dropped them off. He was staying in a hotel. He was about to leave the hotel and go back uh, to Galena when lo and behold, he meets the governor of Illinois who happens to be eating in the restaurant that evening. And that's a guy by the name of Richard Yates. Uh, Richard Yates, uh, um, as a result, hires Grant to become basically a recruiter uh, for Union soldiers. And in that process, uh, Grant starts going around and enrolling soldiers in different places. One of those places was Mattoon, Illinois, where the um, Originally, when they formed the uh, regiments from Illinois, they did it by congressional districts. So this was a 7th District uh, Regiment, it was called. And um, uh, he went down there, and he enrolled the soldiers and then headed back home. Well, um, I, I probably need to skip through this a little bit uh, uh, faster, but um, the long and short of it is, is the... 
men who had voted to elect a fellow na named uh, Good as their colonel decided they didn't want him leading uh, their uh, regiment. And uh, Good got canned uh, purportedly, and it's not purportedly, there's a very good article re out recently. Uh, <clears throat> this fellow um, in Mattoon let the men go off a camp to, to hang out in the saloons. And in fact, many say that Colonel Good was there with them half the time. So the men said, well, hey, wait a minute. We have a guy named Ulysses Grant who enrolled us in Mattoon. Why don't we make him our colonel? Anyway, they did. And that became the 21st Illinois Infantry. Uh, early July or mid-June, Grant arrives in Springfield where these guys are taking their basic training. And then uh, after a few weeks, uh, specifically uh, July 3rd, 1861, it's time for them to march to Missouri uh, to enter the war zone. And they, they were not that well trained. Uh, they were uh, a very obnoxious group of soldiers, but uh, Grant managed to uh, get them into shape. In any case, um, first sign that Grant for the kind of uh, commander he was is there was a railroad that ran all the way from Springfield to, to uh, Quincy. And uh, he said, no, we're not going to take the railroad. We're going to march to Quincy. And that's about 90, 100 miles with these very, very raw troops. And they marched. And they got about halfway there um, when they got an urgent call because this happened. This meaning... Uh, a unit of uh, Southern soldiers, and it was called the Missouri State Guard, this was before the Confederates were actually in Missouri, had attacked a place called um, Monroe City. And this is, a, this is an engraving that showed up in a, one of those weekly newspapers. Uh, this guy was there, but he wasn't leading any troops. This guy was uh, uh, future Governor um, Wood what his uh, first name is. But, so he, he was good with getting the press, but actually nothing good at all came out of the Battle of uh, Monroe City at the Monroe Station, uh, except uh, that is the reason Grant was rushed into Missouri. Uh, he got those men on the train uh, about <coughs> halfway through, and he arrived in Missouri on July 11, 1861, on account of this emergency. Okay. Uh, this is a picture of a uh, building that still stands in Mexico, Missouri. And uh, it was the John Clark uh, Mansion back in 1861. And I bring a picture of it is because that, that building still stands and it's the headquarters of the Historical Society of Mexico, Missouri. And uh, because Grant went to Mexico Soon after he arrived in Missouri, he spent almost two weeks there, about the longest uh, he'd stayed anywhere up to that point. And it's documented that he was inside uh, that building, even though he set up his camp uh, west of town. In that camp, west of town, um, about, and again, I've got some Civil War historians here, so I'm going to be as careful as I can. <laughs> It was about uh, uh, August 4, uh, 1861, uh, that his chaplain came running into his tent with, with a newspaper from St. Louis to tell him that he had been nominated to become a brigadier general. And within several days after that, uh, Grant was, um, well, he knew about it. He wasn't actually received his commission for a couple of weeks. Uh, but he was enlisted basically to do a secret mission down in a place called Ironton, Missouri. I imagine you all know Ironton pretty well and it's not very far to go. So please go over there because they still have a statue and a memorial at the spot where uh, Grant uh, uh, and ca camped it down there. So anyway, let's see. There we go, behind the back. First of all, I wanted to point out this wonderful drawing. It's uh, fairly contemporaneous to the Civil War. And 
it's hard to see, but uh, this is Cairo, Illinois. <coughs> this is the railroad that goes through Sipeson. And this is this huge valley uh, that is now, uh, well, the bottoms after you go south from uh, Cape Girardeau, but which was one of the, was basically, as the picture shows, a huge swamp. Just one small anecdote that comes from Cape Girardeau. Uh, after they built the uh, uh, Panama Canal, uh, they took the equipment they used to move all the earth and they came up to uh, Missouri and they drained this swamp. But before that, uh, the swamp was a huge impediment to armies, for one thing. But it was also a place uh, where uh, um, a man by the name of Jeff Thompson got his <coughs> reputation. And Jeff Thompson was a general of the Missouri State Guard, which I mentioned earlier. And um, uh, he, was a, he had no soldierly training whatsoever, but became uh, Grant's uh, first nemesis. And I dare say that uh, all the men and all the generals that uh, Grant fought after that, no one gave him as much trouble as Jeff Thompson did. So uh, Thompson, he was known as the swamp fox of the Confederacy by some people, mostly it's the swamp fox of Missouri. And uh, he was a odd man, let's just put it that way. And I wanted to give you a, a description of it that came out from a newspaper reporter who had the opportunity to meet Jeff Thompson in September of 1861. <clears throat> His name was Israel Gibbons, and he was a reporter for the New Orleans Crescent, but he was actually a Confederate soldier at the time he met uh, Thompson. And he said, let me picture this man uh, to you. Imagine a tall, lean, lank, wiry looking customer, at least six feet high, and there he is, slender as a pair of tongs, a thin long head with a very long nose, what, we, what you would call a hatchet face, thick yellow hair combed back of his ears and bobbed off short, displaying a very long and thin neck. And he goes on for another paragraph that frankly would be embarrassing for me to read because he was he seemed to be in love with um, <laughs> this guy. And he's a guy who's hard not to love, let me say. And I got, again, pardon my anecdotes, but around this time when uh, Thompson appeared on the scene, um, uh, again, he was a character. Uh, he decided to take a trip to Memphis, kind of an R&R &R trip. Uh, he had been camped at a place called uh, Belmont, Missouri. Uh, this was uh, last week of September, 61. <clears throat> he goes there and he attends the theater. At least one night he was there, and he was only there about three nights. And in the middle of the play, uh, his orderly comes rushing down the, the aisle with a piece of paper in his hand, and he hands it over to the general, uh, General Thompson, and then walks back up the aisle, and everybody's buzzing, and the newspapers are there. And <laughs> Well, his orderly was a guy he called Ajax. And Ajax was purportedly a Native American, and he dressed as a Native American, and he went down that aisle dressed as a Native American. But in fact, he was a, a showboat performer from Cincinnati <laughs> who might have had a little bit of Native Canadian blood. But, um, but anyway, that's how uh, Thompson made his name. And he did a few more things until at the end of, uh, well, at, at one point, uh, he had gotten himself published in the New York Times with some diatribe that he had proclaimed from, from down here in the swamp. And I just wanted to point out that Jeff Thompson was more famous than Ulysses Grant when the two of them uh, butted heads in 1861. So you'll have to come to another show to hear about the other nemeses. Well, here's one, again, very briefly. 
Uh, Benjamin Prentice was a um, lawyer. Um, that, that's the first bad sign of his character um, in uh, Quincy, Illinois, and had been appointed a brigadier general dating to the very same date that um, that Ulysses Grant was, was dated because, well, I might say the first time in American history that there was something like 10 or 12 new brigadier generals who all had the same uh, date of uh, seniority. Now, I don't know who figured out that mess, but sure enough, um, when Grant uh, was in Ar Arrington, um, Prentice came down there to relieve him and presented him papers saying, I'm taking over. And Grant went back to St. Louis and he said, well, wait a minute, I've got seniority over Prentice. And sure enough, after a week or two, uh, Fremont decided that Grant was right. <laughs> but Prentice wasn't going to give it up. So um, Grant went down to Cape Girardeau when he was uh, assigned a major command. And Prentice shows up. Uh, or he's supposed to join Prentice. He's been told that he's to report to Grant, and they basically have a disagreement um, in Cape Girardeau. And uh, uh, Grant uh, wouldn't put him under arrest. He told him to go back where he was supposed to go and get ahead of his troops. But then um, uh, Prentice arrested himself and reported to St. Louis. Uh, now, in his uh, defense, he learned a little bit because it was Prentice, according to most uh, accounts, who saved Grant at Shiloh because Prentice was defending the, or, I'm sorry, commanding the, the troops that were in the so-called harness nest. Let me see how many. Okay, I think I'll finish it up with this one because this is one of my favorite stories. <laughs> Let's bring back uh, uh, General Thompson. We're in October, uh, mid-October of 1861. Um, Thompson had been training his troops, and he had about 3,000 of them, uh, and gallivanting around uh, Memphis, but he hadn't done much. But then all of a sudden on October uh, 15, in the very early morning, pre-dawn, uh, he shows up with a cavalry uh, unit at a place that's less than 50 miles south of St. Louis. It's called the uh, uh, Big River Bridge. In fact, I saw somebody, I think, from DeSoto. Uh, maybe they... Uh, he left. Okay, well, tell them about this. It's only a few miles south of DeSoto. And um, it was totally unexpected. Grant, meanwhile, is commanding from Cairo, Illinois. And um, let me say he, uh, he shows some of his grit in that instance, too. Well, he, here it is. It's Jeff Thompson. St. Louis is in a complete uproar because they thought the war was going on down in the boot hill. And... Um, um, so uh, Grant orders some men to come from uh, uh, Ironton and pile them out, and some men to come from Cape Girardeau. Just cut them off, you know, cut them off while he's retreating. Well, easier said than done. Um, uh, Thompson got to Fredericktown then and uh, took over the town. They sat there for a day, and they took some lead out of the lead mines and put it in uh, wagons to take back south. Uh, and then they left, and they went south of town, and these two converging units arrived in Fredericktown and didn't do anything except themselves just hang around. And uh, Thompson, again, with no, uh, absolutely no uh, military experience or training at all, decides he's going to do, he's going to blood his men. He must have read about it or something, so he's not going to hightail it back down to his camp down the boot hill, uh, he's going to attack these people, these Union soldiers at, uh, at uh, Fredericktown. So <laughs> meanwhile, he has brought an infantry unit up there to Fredericktown as well. And uh, they attack, first of all, they set up a, uh, again, a, a quite a brilliant uh, 
strategy where he had posted, if you've been to Fredericktown, I imagine most of you had, there's a, there's a beautiful valley just south of town. And actually that was the battlefield. It's pristine and the public doesn't own it, but God forbid that something happens to it. But on the south side of that field is a hillside, a rather prominent hill. And Thompson had taken his artillery and put it up there, making it appear that he was in the process of retreating. Okay, but in the meantime, his infantry came forward. They went down in the valley and hid behind fence posts and trees and whatnot. And the Union soldiers went marching out, thinking they were chasing him. Well, they got basically murdered from the side. And... Um, but they, the Union did prevail, the Thompson retreated off, but uh, let me say, I guess, that uh, one thing that uh, Thompson did uh, that should always be remembered is that he caused a unit, well, here, here we go, I keep forgetting, this is a new thing for me, I'm letting uh, my outline appear before I talk. <laughs> um, this is a picture, that, uh, an engraving of a picture from Chicago, Illinois, uh, about October 13, 1861. And this is an eagle that would become famous as Old Abe, because this unit was the 8th Wisconsin Infantry. And those of you who don't read up on the Civil War, uh, first of all, I'll try to fix that, but um, this is the most famous um, animal mascot of any unit in, in any army in the Civil War, and he went with the 8th Wisconsin all through the South. He is said to have fought in 35 uh, battles and was wounded twice, and he basically he got to the point where he would soar over the Confederate lines and just Drive them, <laughs> drive them crazy. But uh, he's a new. You can see he's he's still fledgling, I guess you'd say, when he comes to Chicago on his way to St. Louis. They get to East St. Louis. Uh, they camp the night of the 13th, and in the morning they cross the Mississippi River. First duty that they have is that they uh, have to listen to the politician speak because there was a. The Secretary of War was in town. He had just been in central Missouri uh, reviewing the troops. So they do that, and then they march uh, uh, to the place, actually, that Moses Riney trained to a place called Benton Barracks. And at the time, this was 1861, it was a uh, white northern soldier training camp. Uh, they march up there, and I think it's about seven miles, and halfway there, the eagle gets loose. And the eagle soars over the church, the, the, the house tops and the church steeples. And I thought, oh, goodness, this is our thing. And, but anyway, good news is uh, he landed. I can say he now confidently because they've tested the, his feather for DNA. <laughs> because he is the most famous symbol of Wisconsin, too. Anyway, long and short of it is... Um, he, uh, they're camped on October 14th, their first night in the, in the war zone, and the next morning, bingo, Jeff Thompson destroys the Big River Bridge. So they are immediately rushed into action. Some of the companies wound up in DeSoto, uh, sleeping in the rain, no shelter, and uh, ultimately, they all moved down to uh, Ironton and piled out. One week later, the Battle of Fredericktown occurs. And the 8th um, uh, Wisconsin is the rawest regiment in the Army. So when they get to Fredericktown, uh, their task is to guard the trains, which is... Uh, which are, you have the ammunition and the supplies, and those are the uh, wagons are north of the battlefield at the courthouse. So the men of the 8th Wisconsin, having just 
witness the escape of the eagle, tether him to the uh, uh, courthouse roof, and to their surprise, and I will quote uh, from the book written in 1885 by a guy named Frank Flower, uh, as the rattle of musketry, the hastening of ambulances, the shouting of officers, the screams of projectiles, and the shrieks of the wounded burst upon old Abe's senses in the full tide of battle, he became wild with excitement, leaping and screeching. Now, you've probably heard of, you haven't heard of the screeching eagle, you've heard of the screaming eagle. And uh, here we go, I'm going to try to do this again. Oh, my goodness, the timing. Ah, there we go. I mean, the fact is, uh, and I'll go to questions now, and some of you historians, I'll be happy to defend my position. But in fact, <laughs> I'm going to have to do somersaults. Oh, well, well, that shoulder patch, the 101st Airborne. Uh, that is the Screaming Eagle, and the Screaming Eagle first screamed in Fredericktown, Missouri on uh, October 21, 1861. Anyway, questions? I think Come on, surely there are questions. I know Gary's got some. <laughs> I don't really have a question, but, but there were several from that participated in the black the bridge of the head and ground of the soul. And then several participated in Frederick County, most of them are in the Missouri State College. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, the point was that they had some St. Genevieve soldiers, but mostly on the southern side who were involved in those uh, two incidents. Uh, one of them that is buried up here in Memorial Cemetery was killed at uh, the, the River Bridge. Really? Someone calls it Black River Bridge, but I know that's not right. That's the, uh, no, it's the um, Big River Bridge. Big River Bridge, yeah. yeah. Big, but yeah, he, he was killed there and buried up here. Oh, goodness. Well, it was, again, it was a shock, but it was also. Um, Thompson, and again, you can tell I'm, a, I'm almost as big a fan of Thompson as I am of Grant. But, um, it was the first and longest cavalry raid of the entire Civil War, and that's why it was such a surprise. And nobody was, frankly, nobody was expecting the cavalry could let loose from its uh, moorings and travel. It was 100 miles they went from their camp up to DeSoto. And, um, uh, but the idea is one that hadn't even occurred before because already in 1861, people started to realize that if you could cut a railroad behind your foe, uh, your foe was gonna have to retreat because they already become dependent on the railroad for uh, their supplies. Any other questions? I'm just curious about the eagle. I had never heard of any of that. But um, if he was causing such havoc flying over the Confederate forces, what, why didn't they shoot him? They tried. That's oh, how I got wounded. <laughs> In fact, um, it was Sterling Price, who had been a governor of Missouri and who was fighting here in Missouri in 1861. Uh, at the Battle of Corinth, Mississippi, uh, he remarked, because the eagle was flying over his formations, is that uh, he would rather have that uh, eagle than a, uh, than a regiment of troops or a, a Union battle flag. Uh, it was that effective. Yes, Mark? Yeah, and what did they, what did they call the eagle, Greg? What was the eagle's nickname? Old Abe. Right. Named for the uh, president of course. But yeah, go to for that picture. Uh, the, Well, you're going to miss the switcheroo again. I'll have to do that next time. Whoops, there. 
This uh, picture of the eagle there is, uh, I have to credit, um, Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, I have to credit Tori Kemper, who's a reporter with Fredericktown the Democrat News. Uh, this, actually, you go see this. This is by the courthouse in Fredericktown. It's called the War Eagle Monument. Because for about the last 12, 15 years, Fredericktown has realized how important the event was that occurred there. And the battle itself was extremely important in Grant's history. Uh, it was the first time he commanded troops who fought in battle, even though he was commanding them from a distance. And then not long after that, the Battle of Belmont, he, in Missouri, he commanded troops in person. Um, and that was the switcheroo that you'll have to wait for the maybe the 10th anniversary of the, of the museum. Uh, other question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, with Thompson, you said he had no military experience, but he was put in command. I mean, did that happen quite often when somebody pushed up their high rank to command these people because of the urgency? Well, like everything else, there's a story behind Thompson's rise to the generalship. And I, now that you mention it, let me tell you. Um, there was a, the Missouri State Guard was, uh, uh, was divided into, I think it was eight, districts across the state and the southeast district had been commanded by a fellow who was the half brother of Henry Clay um, south of Cape Girardeau there is a place where he's buried uh, his name's going to uh, come to me in a minute but anyway he uh, was a southerner but he didn't like the direction that the war was going so very, very early on, he had been the Brigadier General of the Southeast District. He said, I'm quitting. So they were basically running a contest to see who would replace him. And um, Thompson shows up at, a, at the camp down south of Dexter with a white horse, and he's got a Bowie knife stuck in his belt, and he gives them a speech, and they elect him. So, <laughs> and Thompson had been... Uh, before the war, he was the mayor of St. Joseph, Missouri. He was born in Virginia, but in fact, Thompson was the man who in 1860 uh, handed off the mail that the first Pony Express rider, rider took to San Francisco. So, and actually, there are two books. Uh, I, I, I'll sign up on the sheet out there when you're out there, and I'll make sure I get you the sites to the to the books about Thompson, because he's, he's a character. Okay, well, I think that will do it then, and thank you all for your attention, and I'll be signing some books if anybody's interested in buying. The proceeds does go to this wonderful museum, and uh, I want to thank my cousin Bob for uh, thank you for being putting here. this together. It. Thank you. Thank you.